Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We're so glad you have found us and are joining us here and for our virtual worship service. As you may have noticed, we are not currently having in-person services yet, but our leadership of the church is, start, is talking about it. And we are moving towards figuring out what protocols will be in place and hope to have a date for you more at the beginning of this year than later. But we are being very careful. We are watching and following Virginia Department of Health. We want to create a safe environment for when we do regather. In the meantime, we still are virtual. We also want you to put on your calendar for February 24th. We will have a Zoom business meeting. It'll start at six o'clock. And if you want to request the Zoom link from the password and the meeting ID from our church office, just send us an email at office at fbcwborough.org. We'll send that over to you and then also send a reminder the date of February 24th, 6 o'clock will be our next Zoom business meeting. We are glad you have paused with us to slow your week, to pause in the midst of your day so we could worship our risen Christ together. Let us awaken ourselves to God's presence as we go to God together in prayer. Everlasting God, we invoke your Spirit. We ask that you be with us in this time. Help us to experience your grace and your love. Help us to understand the depth of what forgiving ourselves and others looks like. Give us the audacity to want to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. God, this time of worship is for you. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen.
Hello, neighbors. I've got my cell phone here, and I use it a lot, probably more than I should, but there are things about it that confuse me. I need help sometimes figuring things out on my phone, and I usually ask my daughter to help me when I'm confused about things. You know what? And that's what we do. We help people who need us when they're confused to help them figure things out. And people can be confused about other things too. Can you believe that they're confused neighbors who think that the only neighbors they should love are the neighbors that look like them or live in the same neighborhood as them or go to the same church as they do? It's true. We have some confused neighbors about, they're confused about different things. This summer, we actually read a couple of books about some people who were very brave, Ruby Bridges and Rosa Parks. And they had to deal with those confused neighbors. They had to deal with those people who thought because they didn't look like them, that somehow they didn't deserve the same fairness. Hmm. This month, February, is Black History Month. And during the month, we do learn about people like Ruby Bridges and Rosa Parks. And we learn about people who are unfair to them, people who are confused about what it means to be a neighbor people who are confused about people being different. They're confused about how important it is to accept those differences and celebrate those differences. They're confused about a lot of things. During Black History Month, we don't learn just about the unfairness that some people have had to face because of differences. We also learn about all the amazing things that African Americans have contributed to make our lives so great. The cell phone, do you know that an African American was the one who invented the technology that they needed to use to make a cell phone? What a smart guy. So I am so glad that we have all of this information to celebrate and honor black Americans. But what about those confused neighbors? Hmm. Well, Jesus tells us that we have to love everybody, right? We love those confused neighbors too. And I guess he's really telling us that when we love everybody, we're going to show them what loving our neighbor is all about. And you guys, the kids, I have to say, you're the ones that inspire a lot of grown-ups who might be confused neighbors to be better neighbors. You guys are the ones who are so great at showing love to all neighbors. So we need to love those confused neighbors too. And while we love them, they're going to be watching you. They're going to be learning from you. And I'm so glad that they are. Our scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark. This is chapter 3, starting in verses 19, reading through verse 30. Then he went home, and the crowd came to gather again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, the house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, 
people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, He had an unclean spirit. This is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. My dad always said, the church has some of the best people in the world in it, and some of the worst. Here's what he meant. Church is like a hospital for the spiritually sick and wounded. We reconcile, mend, heal, worship, serve, give, grace, forgive, and recognize and bless people at church. Church is amazing at its best. It's the premier place for furthering the kingdom of God on earth and espousing deep theological truths that awaken our soul to the ever-expanding, inclusive love of God. At its best, the church is the most life-enhancing entity in all the world. At its best. But within the petri dish of goodness, the church is also where people ridicule, judge, look down on, cast out, gossip, withhold, block, 
harass, impede, misinform, and hurt feelings. And I'm not just talking about us. I'm talking about every church everywhere, all the time, and in all time periods, this kind of good and bad emerge. And so this is why my dad says church has some of the best and the worst right here in it. This is true for the Gospels too, by the way. This isn't something that's new. I mean, our text today is Mark chapter 3. It's not soft or pretty. It's fierce. And we see some of the worst religion has to offer in it. It has a lot for us to hold. So before we get into it, just so you know, it's a battle of wits and wiles between Jesus' vision of the kingdom of God on earth and then the religious leader's vision. And it gets so bad that family gets involved. So let's jump into this and just see what we see, starting in verse 19. Then he went home. Talking about Jesus going home to Nazareth after traveling around Galilee. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. This is his family, fueled by fear of the crowd. They seek to restrain Jesus, to tie him up. Why? Now, prominent religious people think Jesus' teachings, forgiveness of sin, His ability to heal, is just all too much. So religious leaders, they get involved, and then they get His family worked up. I mean, this is an intervention of sorts, but not in a good way. If you remember in Luke's version, when Jesus returns home, people are so glad to see Him. They invite Him to read Scripture for the day in the synagogue. He reads from Isaiah and starts to interpret that text, illustrating God's care for certain questionable characters like the imprisoned. And Jesus says they're going to be set free. And the crowd is filled with rage. They try to hurl him off a cliff. Luke 4, 28-29. Here in Mark, the scene is his home. But his family and the religious authorities want to tie him up because his teachings, his miracles, his forgiveness of sins, it's all too much. Just keep in mind, these are the religious people who are most offended by Jesus. And Baptist theologian Bill Leonard says, From the 1st to the 21st century, citizens of Jesus' new community can be a blessing or an embarrassment at least insofar as the families are concerned. And this is where it gets messy. Jesus is embarrassing himself according to his family. He's a threat according to the religious authorities. But according to Jesus, his family is the embarrassment and the religious authorities are the threat. And so this battle for the public square, you know, it still happens today. There are a lot of churches and preachers and public Christian leaders who are an absolute threat to the ongoing, ever-expanding love of God. But they don't think they are. And that's why lines get drawn in the sand all the time. Doctrines and statements of faith get written. We exhaust ourselves figuring out where we stand and where you stand, and we make sure to be quite clear about how you're wrong, but I'm right. There are all kinds of evidence over the years. I mean, think about the Crusades from the Middle Ages in the Middle East, or the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago in Germany, or even the conservative resurgence in the 90s here in America. I mean, this is literally why the Church of England started, because somebody had to draw a line in the sand. The church has always reacted to changing times and cultural shifts as if they're the strong man who sees and tries to snuff out the threat. So much so in Mark 3, look what happens in verse 22. The scribes come down from Jerusalem. That's how bad it's gotten. Nazareth is a know-nothing town. I mean, remember, can anything good come from Nazareth? 
Well, right now, it's the center of the political controversy. So much, the scribes from Jerusalem's temple have traveled to seek Jesus out. And then they find him, and they see him as a threat to the established order, and that he's doing things that should not be done. And so now, things get tense. Families involved. And they've sided with the power players from Jerusalem. And so they're trying to shut Jesus down and up. I mean, look what the scribes say. He has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Beelzebul is a Philistine god, later adopted by some Abrahamic traditions as a major demon. There are some Christian communities that say he is one of the seven princes of hell. So, this is quite the accusation. I mean, the scribes are saying that Jesus is empowered by the satanic figure. I mean, you don't get much worse than being accused by the religious authorities as being controlled by the devil himself. By the way, religious authorities still use this tactic today. I mean, I would say Christian leaders, by and large, are the worst at it. I think in my lifetime, I can name three of the most prominent areas that have ruptured and embarrassed and threatened the leadership of our churches. They've come in the areas of race, politics, and sexuality. I'm only 36 years old, but I've seen churches become more racist, not less. Now, not all of them. There are tons of churches that are becoming far less racist, more inclusive, more aware of prejudice every day. But there are others that double down. They show up looking to restrain, to name the threat. We've also witnessed the overarching movement of a politically aligned church. Now, I told you prior to the presidential election, there were Baptist denominations and evangelical nonprofits that would call and mail paraphernalia to me, making sure that I was equipped at helping you vote Republican. It was a matter of good versus evil, and I was reminded that my job as your pastor was to stand in the middle of a tense and spiritual battle for the soul of our nation. <laughs> I was sent ballots that had actual Democratic nominee names with a red X over it, declaring them agents of evil. The Republican candidate was an agent of God. That's dangerous stuff right there. I also got emails and campaigns from Democrats asking me to sign something that demonizes the Republican candidate too, and then calling me to call our church to make a stand. So it really did go both ways. Please note this. I threw all that stuff away. I don't stand in the middle of a political battle of good versus evil. I stand in the light of love and invite you and your family to stand with me and mine as we shine God's light. Now, I am all for fighting for what you think is right. I get the tactics of lobbying. We have to fight for a world that we want to live in, and I'm proud of those who step in and give voice to the voiceless. I am not putting them down. We need prophets, and at times, I get to play that role too. I'm just not going to let you militarize or politicize my position or our church. We're not at war. We're inviting all people into the light of love. Now, finally, in my lifetime, I've seen and still grieve with anyone who has been shunned or ostracized or made to feel unlovable because their sexuality or, or even just the questioning of it. In my lifetime, the church has blamed famine, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, mass shootings, war, and school shootings all on the backs of the LGBTQ population, while supporting legislation that limits their rights to marry, adopt, go to the bathroom, and worship. It's utterly absurd the links Christian figureheads have gone to shun and restrain and blame the LGBTQ population. It's the religious authorities that are the strong men, and it's the opposite of what Jesus' kingdom looks like. But these tactics that are used today, they're nothing new. 
They're the same that the scribes are doing in Mark 3. And Jesus sees right through it and responds with the same tone back. And by the way, I get that you might be charged up a bit right now. And this is important to note because I'm not talking directly to you. I'm just rolling with the text here. But this is a very charging and feelings-producing chapter. And we're about to hear Jesus, some of the harshest language directed to the religious elite. As a matter of fact, this is pretty much true throughout all the Gospels. Jesus' most direct and harshest comments are directed to the religious. He only calls one person Satan in all the Gospels, Peter. He calls the religious authorities hypocrites, brood of vipers, blind guides. And what he's about to say in Mark 3 is just as blistering, and it's directed to the scribes. Why do you think that is? Look at verse 23. And he called them to him, and he spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm not acting satanically. You are. You're the house that's divided. Not me. Not what I'm doing. You're rising up against yourself. I'm not Satan. I'm the plunderer. Look at verse 27. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Jesus is saying, you're the strong man. I'm going to tie you up and I'm going to plunder the kingdom that you've been building. And this is the blistering language that I'm talking about. Now you may not like it, and I get it. We all would prefer a more gentle Jesus. And there are times when we get that version of Jesus in the Gospels, but not here. He's standing in the face of oppressors right here, and he does not back down. He takes on the established order. He calls into question their behaviors, their systems, their theology, and he tells them he seeks to replace all of it. He's bringing in his kingdom. One that's infused with love and inclusion and grace and reconciliation for all people. But he's going to have to tie up the strong man to do it. It's the only way. So he goes right for the religious authorities. But you better believe they're going to respond. They're going to show their strength because they're strong. They try to restrain Jesus. They tie him up. They want to throw him off a cliff in Luke. They want to press him against a mountainside in John. Ultimately, they arrest him, beat him, show their power and might in all four Gospels by killing him on a cross. And in so doing, they reveal their true colors. You see how biting this is? Jesus and the religious authorities are like oil and water. Jesus is a threat to the establishment. And they don't like it. Now, we could keep going, because Mark 3 actually gets even worse. But I think you get the point. Now, let me tie all this up. You may be wondering, if Jesus' kingdom is so inclusive and loving, and we're supposed to be taking all of this and holding it in the light of what our sermon series is on loving our neighbor, how is what Jesus is doing any better than what the scribes do to him? Aren't they both acting out? You could read it that way. This is not an easy text. But if we read it in concert with the rest of the gospel, it is easier to hold. Yes, Jesus calls out his confused religious leaders. And they don't like it, and they don't take kindly to it. But he still eats with them later. He goes to their houses later. He learns and laughs and teaches with them later. He doesn't turn away from them. He engages them. That's what I want you to understand and see. Jesus doesn't cancel them or unfriend them. He leans in. He actually goes further into community with them. I told our youth 
a few weeks ago on our Zoom Sunday School class that our current cancel culture is a severe, it's severely problematic. Now, cancel culture is the notion that we write off or silence anyone who does something that culture de deems inappropriate. Now, some icons have experienced the shun of popularity and rightfully so. Not everyone who has position and power in this world should be afforded the privilege to keep it. But what I mean by cancel culture being problematic is it leaves no room for fault or forgiveness. No growth can happen when the playing field is so static that you're either in or you're out. Church has to be a place where things can get messy. Critique has to be allowed to exist. People can change their minds. And while the back and forth is happening, we have to hold each other in unconditional positive regard. Now this isn't easy, but it's what Jesus does to his confused neighbors. And it's what we must do today. We have to love our neighbors. And this can be hard. Because so much of who we are is defined by what we or some authority believe that or tells us what is right or wrong or in or out or this or that or us versus them. But as we've said so far during this sermon series, if we can remain humble, kind, turn towards our neighbor, develop the ability for self-critique, hold their convictions, yet still be comfortable in ours, then neighboring gets easier. Loving your neighbor requires a rise in consciousness if we're to move towards inclusion. Churches who can see beyond doctrine and dogma, Christians who can love those who think differently and hold one another in positive regard, we will be the ones who bring Jesus' kingdom to earth far faster than those who can't. Those who cancel and shun and tie up and push out, there's nothing loving about that. We all must move towards inclusion and love. It's the way we get to God. And the best way to do that is we learn to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the tiger, the one who lives in fear, for the good Lord has come to seek and save. These are 